today is a tour with Peralt Farms. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to our host today, Jeremy. Um, and we're going to be here with Jeff and Jason Peralt. Take it away, guys. Well, hey, everyone. Uh, like Nicole said, I'll be hosting this. Uh, thank you for jumping in, which I could see everybody in person, but it's a different kind of year. Uh, hopefully, I'll see everybody here soon. But uh, yeah, so today we are uh, here with Jeff and Jason Peralt uh, with Peralt Farms. Really happy to have them on. They're one of the main people we work with at Yakima Chief. Uh, some of the best hops in the some of the best hops in the state, even the Northwest, even the world, I'd say. But uh, yeah, so if you guys could just kind of give me a quick intro of yourselves, um, kind of what you do for Peralt Farms, and yeah, take it away from there. Go ahead, right, Jeff. Get us started. All right. Uh, my name is Jeff Peralt. I'm the Vice President of Resources and Compliance here at Peralt Farms. And I'm Jason Peralt. I'm the CEO. Cool. Happy to have you on. So uh, let's dig into Peralt Farms a little bit, kind of dig into the history of it. Um, so when, when was Peralt Farms founded, just to start off? Um, I can tackle that one. So the the farm as we know it today it was started, uh, first harvest was 1969 uh, in our current location, but my grandfather had actually started farming in other areas of the valley prior to that. And uh, the first hops grown within the family were grown in the 1920s by my great grandfather. Uh, they came to the Yakima Valley in the early 1900s, uh, came from Canada via Minnesota. They lived in Minnesota for a while then ended up here uh, to be our uh, our great grandfather uh, was sent over by his dad when he was 18 years old on a, on a freight train to come over here and, and homestead. So started farming in the Moxie Valley in the early 1900s, uh, farmed their first hops up there. And then uh, they had, we always joke, they had about 13 acres of hops and they had 13 kids. So one, one kid per acre, that was kind of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the labor force, but of course that 13 children on a small farm that doesn't support that many families. So all the, all the kids kind of went off and did their own thing. And our grandfather uh, uh, ended up uh, where we're at now. And then uh, my dad and my mom and dad took it over from there. And Jeff and I represent the fourth generation and our kids are the fifth. So. Very cool. What was, uh, what were your grandparents growing before hops? Um, hops have always been the, for, for Peralt Farms, we know it now, it's really been always been the main crop. You know, prior to going back to my great-grandfather's day back up in Moxie, they grew um, hops, but they also grew potatoes, corn, you know, some of your other standard staple type crops. Um, but uh, once uh, Peralt Farms was established in the 1960s, as we know it now, it's it's been primarily hops. So, and throughout the years, we've grown some other crops like apples, mm -hmm. uh, cherries, and pears. Uh, we've since uh, diversified into uh, blueberries now, and uh, and we have a herd of bison as well. Pretty neat. When did the bison come about? About 2011 or so. Pretty neat. Well, cool. Um, so how many acres is uh, Peral Farms right now? So we're oh, go ahead, Jason. No, you go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Um, we're, we're about 1,400 acres this year. Cool. How many? Uh, how many? How many different varieties? Um, yeah. If you look at our main varieties, I think there's uh, 10 of our main varieties that we, we'll be picking, and then we have a number of experimentals uh, through our close association with the the YCR HBC breeding program. Cool. Yeah, we'll definitely dig into that a little bit more a little later, but. Uh, yeah, so first off, um, obviously this is a different year, uh, normally selection, I mean, you guys are obviously hustling right now, September, October is kind of a big time for you, but different year, everything kind of going on, how are you guys doing, how's everything looking out there? <clears throat> yeah, this year has definitely been, uh, with COVID, has definitely been a, a, a challenge, at least. Um, our biggest priority is obviously keeping our employees safe and, and healthy. Um, and so far we've done a, a really good job, I think. Um, but yeah, just this year during harvest, it just seems so different to not have, you know, all of our brewer friends coming to visit us. You know, we built a lot of really good relationships with brewers and 
always look forward to to visiting with them during harvest and we just don't have it you know it's it's a really odd year but uh but as far as harvest goes um i'd say things are going pretty good um you know uh you know having the right employees in the right uh position is probably your greatest asset and we we definitely have that so i think uh uh, just having uh, having those people um, in the right spots is keeping things moving pretty well. Yeah, that's good. I know it's uh, it's definitely been weird not having any of the brewers around. You know, it's definitely it's almost kind of normally it's like a shoulder to shoulder type of thing, which is all brewers okay. from all over the world coming and visiting. And I know they're missing it. I know you guys are probably missing it as well. So. Um, yeah, glad you guys are still up and going and everything like that. But uh, so from here, we're uh, probably going to play a video. Um, just kind of do a little quick walkthrough of a pre-recorded video, kind of see the facilities, things like that. Um, and then after that, we'll kind of dig into the processes of the hop growing and everything like that. You guys are all good with that? Cool. Yes. <laughs> So I'm Jeff Peralt with Peralt Farms. I'm going to give you guys a, a short little tour of our pre-harvest uh, activities. So uh, it's time to get everything going and let's go take a tour. So this is where we do all of our maintenance, um, all of our equipment ready. Obviously on a hot farm you have a ton of rolling stock that has to be ready uh, on a weekly basis. And this is where it all happens. So we're going up now to our, our main kiln. The hops will be laid out evenly in these beds, uh, about 28 inches high. And then they're heated. Depends on the variety. It can be anywhere from like five to nine hours here in the kiln. So Stephen, if you could um, just just explain uh, what kind of, tr or what the process was in learning how to dry hops. ¿Qué es, qué es el proceso por, por el, el seco de los, los hops? Darle su tiempo son más o menos como unas cinco horas para, para secar, dependiendo del tipo de hops. Eh, es un poco complicado a veces por, um, dependiendo la variedad. Hay yeah, variedad depends on the variety. Son, hay variedad de hops que son hours. muy rápido, otros que son muy lentos. Eh, um, y si es una cosa importante, puedes dejarla en su punto para que no haya problemas. Yeah, so. Yeah, he's saying uh, it, it just depends on the variety. So there's a, a huge art form, a huge art to drawing. So it's not something that you just simply come out here and check with a machine. Um, it's something that you really have to learn and there's a huge art behind it. Just like IPM is, is igual, huh? Yeah. It's, it's something that you, you just get a feel for it in time and it's just experience and practice. So in farming and agriculture, there's the scientific side of things and then you have the, the art side of things, which is, is really cool. All right, come on in. My dad, uh, grandpa, uh, Tim Peralt, and then Tim's brother, they own uh, Peralt Manufacturing, Chuck and Ken Peralt, uh, they developed it. So the, the Peralt name is Peralt Manufacturing. So we're gonna have to hug while we talk uh, so we can hear both of us on the mic. <laughs> Cut. These are organics, so we've got organic citra organic simp go over this side and then in the center we've got some organic mosaic so we'll go through take a look at a couple leaves here with a staven so staven's looking for his leaves so the way we do it is we check uh, three different locations on the vine at 32 locations per field it usually takes about 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes to check each field so now we're going to move over to our uh, bailing room go ahead come on in this is the vacuum system that Colmar put in. What this is doing is uh, instead of emitting all the, all the pieces of hops after the, the plunger pushes, um, it'll push air out and you know dry hops will, will be flown pretty much everywhere um, and then they're stepped on and whatnot. And um, in order to eliminate that or uh, mitigate that as much as possible, we put this system in where there's actually a vacuum that cleans up all that waste and then puts it back in on the belt on the front end over here. We're hand sewing, um, so we have a baler uh, employee on each side. They'll sew each side of the bales, and then the bales will be um, dropped off onto this little uh, 
conveyor pad here, a roller pad, and then we sew the ends up. The bale's weighed, the weight's documented, bale number's documented, and then we'll line them up, get them stenciled, and then put into the cooling room until we can ship them off to YCH. Harvest is just a, a very, very small portion of what we're doing out here on the hop farms. And we're really, really working hard on, on building uh, uh, that labor force, a local labor force here uh, at Pearl Farms. Uh, maybe if we can talk to Brenda a little bit. Brenda's our HR manager. Brenda's been here for about four years now, right? And she's doing an outstanding job. Because Pearl Farms' goal is to build that permanent workforce, um, our harvest season for May is actually one of the easier times because we've, we're using our employees that we've used all year. So they've received consecutive training throughout the year. Uh, and when it comes to pre-harvest training, we do specialized teams. So I'll do a group of 10 people that are doing one set of jobs and we'll work on them. And because they are returning employees, it just gets easier and easier every year. Um, and that's kind of our ideal, that's our goal, um, that we're having our returning employees come in year after year and completing the seasons with us. I've seen that throughout these four years. My first year, it was really hard to even get those slots uh, filled. But by this time, um, it's actually just everyone's kind of uh, fitting into their, into their position. So it's getting easier as the years go by. Thank you guys for, for touring with us here at Pearl Farms. This year's definitely been a different year with COVID. Um, harvest is going to be uh, very different and not having our, our brewing partners here to come out to the farm and tour with us. But we will uh, persevere through this and hopefully next year uh, we'll all be able to get together and, and carry on life as normal. So this time I'm going to end the tour with Pearl Farms. You guys are going to go over with uh, Yakima Chief Ranches and tour with Joe. So I appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you. How's it going everybody? I'm Joe Catron. I'm the VP of Footprints here at Yakima Chief Ranches. Uh, Peralt Farms is not just a hop ranch. There's actually a, a herd of about 50 bison out there and then a block of organic blueberries up on Toppenish Ridge. Uh, in addition to that, it's also the corporate headquarters of Yakima Chief Ranches. And I'm going to show you a little bit of what we do here. There's Bo. Bo does geographic information systems stuff. Way to go, Bo. Another proud Sela resident there. We like him. So we'll go ahead and step in here. This is uh, kind of the crown jewel of the office for a lot of folks. This is our this is our tasting room. The Yakima Chief Ranches, our, our, our core competency is, is breeding, breeding hops, developing new varieties. And so a lot of the evaluation of those new varieties happens in here on our little half barrel pilot system. You can kind of see around the corner. So half barrel, more beer system, a couple jacketed fermenters around the corner. It's fun to uh, share some beers and share some conversation with all the brewers coming to visit and, and talk about those, those new experimentals coming down the pipeline. So this is what we call single hill, kind of year two actually in our breeding process. So the first year as a seedling, they make it through that round of selection. Uh, we'll, we'll dig it up and, and bring it over here to single hill. So this is where they'll stay for the next three years. Uh, We'll raise them all the way to commercial height trellis and treat them much like a commercial hop. But really evaluating everything from cone set to aroma, obviously, to disease resistance or susceptibility. A whole, whole battery of criteria that, that will run them through. So three full years here where every single plant, every single hill uh, is a genetically unique individual. So um, this is really kind of a kind of heaven on earth for, for the, the hop heads and a lot of people that are really into uh, new aroma development and, and just the, the the direction that our our collective industries are going. Yeah, so that about does it here in Single Hill. You know, for those of you that have been out here before, we're sure gonna miss you this year. For those of you who haven't made it out here before, uh, I look forward to seeing you next year, hopefully. Um, until then, stay safe, keep making great beer. We'll talk to you soon. fun i had a good time with that so thank you guys for uh filming that up and all that so one thing i did want to touch on that i noticed in that video that i think is really cool um and i know uh Peralt really takes a lot of pride in that is the sustainability not just of producing awesome hops but also with your workforce and kind of providing an awesome uh work experience for those i know uh 
selection in, in, you know, in the past has always been kind of a seasonal thing, but I know you guys really push for a year round worker. Uh, can you guys kind of touch on that and kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So like I said earlier, um, having the right employee in the right spot is our biggest asset here on the farm. Um, you can make harvest or, or any job uh, much easier just by having the right employees and um, having that workforce that's returning every year. Um, so that's a big part of our, our business model is um, trying to recruit and maintain uh, those relationships with employees. Um, we start out the season in February um, digging roots and you know a lot of people have this idea that hop harvest is our, our our biggest push, our biggest employee load, but actually it's not. So right now we have about, uh, with our three picking machines, we have about 180 employees uh, working for us to keep those machines going. But if you go into the springtime, when things, you know, when we're really under time crunch to get things done, we could have up to 300 to 350 employees. And um, so this year, because of COVID, we didn't take part in the H2A program, like we typically have been taking part in. Um, you know, in the springtime. And um, I'm proud to say that we had no issues with maintaining uh, uh, the relationships with employees and, and keeping them here employed and we got all the jobs done. Um, so which is a, a, a pretty big deal, I think. Um, but there is jobs during harvest that are harder to fill. Uh, one example is, is hanging hops. Um, you know, man, manual labor is, is, uh, is difficult to find uh, people that want to do manual labor uh, or the harder jobs for just only a month long month time. So we do utilize the H2H program during harvest for hanging hops. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, you know building those relationships and 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 uh, getting quality employees, um, keeping them happy and keeping them employed is a, a huge part of our business. Could you kind of touch on what the H2A program is for people who might not be? So you have the H2A program is a work visa program where you can temporarily bring help up from, um, typically it's from Mexico, but you can, you know, there's several different countries that, that take part of the H2A program. Uh, the reason Mexico is so widely utilized because the employers have to pay for transportation in and out. So obviously Mexico is a lot cheaper than say, you know, getting someone from, uh, you know, further away. Um, but uh, it's a work visa program. You can bring people in temporarily. Um, in taking part of the program, there's several different regulations that you have to adhere by, a lot of red tape to take part in the program, uh, but it's really been kind of a lifeline, not just for the hop industry, but for the egg industry in general. Um, if you think of just in our, in Yakima Valley, if you think of all the different uh, egg commodities that are being picked during the month of September, so we're not only, you know, competing with other hop growers for labor, we're competing with the apple industry, um, you know, large farms like Zirkle Fruit, they might bring in up to 2,000 H2A employees. So, um, so that program is a lifesaver for, uh, for egg, the egg industry in the United States. Very cool. Yeah, no, and it, it seems like a really, really neat thing. I know that they all appreciate it and all seem like I'm they're, very appreciative. You know, yeah, yeah, they so come up here and work hard. You hear stories from some of our guys. So we had uh, one guy, uh, the first he came here, he was, he was talking about uh, uh, your returning year, he was telling me about building his house. Um, he, he built a house with the money that he'd saved working here on the H2A contract. Obviously, you know, down in Mexico, you can build a house for a lot less than up here in the States. Um, and then the second year, he was building the second story of the house. So, I mean, you're, we're really um, helping, helping people out in, in taking part of the program. So I, I feel good about it. Yeah, as you should. Um, cool. So let's start digging into uh, the actual, like, you know, growing it, um, the actual kind of ins and outs of what your year kind of looks like. So starting in like February, March is kind of right around the time that the hops are kind of going in the ground, the poles are being put up. Um, what, what, what's kind of your February, March sort of look like? So obviously um, in our in our area, we've, we've got weather to contend with. So some years we can get out in the fields fairly early, as early as, you know, second week of February. It seems like the last couple of years, we've had more snow or more, more water in the soil. So we haven't been able to get out uh, uh, as early as we have in the past, but it all depends on, on weather. Um, so we'll start out digging roots. Um, and then we kind of slowly, we, as the year springtime progresses, 
as time goes on, we, we slowly hire more people. So we might have um, a little bit of a lull the first two weeks of March, and then you get into you know, planting rhizomes. Um, you wanna have them planted by the third week of March. So you start up again and you get planted, and then you start your twining season, and you just progress throughout the season. And um, twining, right after twining is training, um, depending on the variety you might train uh, two, sometimes up to three different times, depending on the quality of the job. Um, and then things kind of peak about June, mid-June, and then they kind of start to slow down a little bit. And we'll move into blueberries at our farm. So a lot of growers have other commodities that they grow where they can move employees and, and, and keep them employed. And then August is usually kind of a, a quieter month. The first part of August, you've got uh, you know, your pesticide application and some IPM stuff going on. Um, maybe a little bit of weeding here and there in the hop fields, uh, just kind of cleaning things up. And then you really, what you're doing is you're getting your crews ready for the harvest season, which starts at the end of August. So that's just kind of in substance what we do. Obviously there's a lot more that goes to that. There's a ton of things that are orchestrated throughout the year, but that's just a short, uh, short little ex explanation. Yeah, I've always been curious about how you guys uh, like plan out your acreage and like kind of know what to grow year to year. Yeah, that really boils down to, uh, you know, what's in demand, working with uh, great folks at Yakima Chief Hops and uh, figuring out what, what's needed to be grown. And then, uh, you know, a big piece of that is, is uh, just like any process, it's uh, looking at your throughput capabilities, um, you know, whether it be in the field or at harvest and determining how many acres you can grow of a given variety. Using harvest as an example, every variety has a, an ideal picking window. And uh, particularly with the, uh, the uh, Yakima Chief Ranch's uh, footprints program, we're, we're required to pick within those windows to make sure we're picking a consistent quality. So if we, can't, if we don't have the machinery to get through a certain number of acres, we won't plant them. So that kind of dictates uh, what we plant uh, based upon our, uh, our ability to get through it. So you kind of mentioned the footprints uh, program there, and I know that that's a really cool thing that uh, Grawl takes part in. Could you kind of explain that a little bit? Yeah, so that's uh, something that came about from Yakima Chief Ranch as a, as a means of, um, of, of, you know, the, the philosophy of uh, creating, growing, and protecting value. It's really a measure, uh, a way of, of creating and protecting that value that's been developed through the, the, the brands that have come out of the breeding program. The effort is to make sure that we're picking the most consistent top quality product possible year in, year out, so the brewers know what they, you know, to expect. And so Footprints itself, the name comes from uh, actually uh, something uh, our grandfather used to say. I actually think it's an old Chinese proverb, but it's, uh, you know, the best fertilizer is the farmer's footprints in the field. And so we have this kind of core, uh, you know, uh, philosophy that, uh, you have to be present um, in the field and uh, in order to grow this crop and that's uh, that is the best fertilizer and so uh, we we send uh, uh, every year we hire a team of interns to uh, walk each field uh, make sure looking for op types and males and, and other quality type issues and then uh, and, and then that as part of that also you know there's there's a specific quality requirements like I said things like picking windows and and uh, other requirements that the grower must adhere to as part of that program as well. Again, with the overreaching goal to, uh, to ensure quality. Do you see any kind of, uh, you mentioned picking windows, do you see any kind of correlation to certain hops being picked early or certain hops being picked later? Like is it an alpha acid heavy hops are picked later and aromatic are picked early or do you see anything like that? Um, I, you know, I don't think there's a, there's necessarily a correlation there. I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the challenge and we can, we can get, uh, we can geek out on this a little bit, but, uh, you know, the challenge is, is, is every, every variety is going to, uh, you got, you got, you got the, the challenge of balancing physiological maturity within the plant and crop maturity. And so most of your higher yielding varieties, when you come out of a breeding program are going to tend to correlate with later maturity, just because the crop has that much more time to develop. And then those, those varieties that we tend to pick the crop early, we're not giving the plant enough time to put reserves down into the crown and, and, uh, and come back strong next year. So there are some negative correlations with, with maturity and, and yield. But for the most part, 
it's all genetically driven and um, certain varieties are just gonna be picked at certain times. Now within a given variety even, that window you can see differences in quality. You know, for, for example, uh, Simcoe is what I would consider a very forgiving variety. On the front end, when you first start picking at the end of August, it gets this, it has this really bright kind of citrusy aroma uh, that then as it matures, kind of starts to go in a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more intense tropical notes, things like that. And then finally goes into uh, more of a pine, dank type aroma at the end. So there's this kind of progression. And, and it, it's all good. It just kind of depends on the brewer's preference. And that's one of the reasons for selection. So they can come out and smell the differences between those. And that whole window, you know, last 10 days or, or probably more than that, it's probably closer to two weeks for Simcoe. But you take a variety like Citra and that window is much tighter. It's what I would consider an unforgiving variety. You know, it's got a much tighter window that's more in that seven to 10 day range. And once it goes over that, you go into a real onion garlic. And that's what we're trying to avoid is to, you know, going tipping over the scales and getting into those aromas that are less desirable, uh, you know, caused by oxidation and other factors. So. Very neat. Yeah. So is that, uh, finding that pick window, uh, variety to variety, is that something that you'll go out and actually have like scientific data behind or is it something that I know I've seen some people just come out, rub some hops, go, Oh, it's going to be about 10 days away. <laughs> so is that that's kind of that art versus science that Jeff was mentioning in uh, in his video? But uh, can you guys kind of touch on that? How how do you go about knowing when a hop is a Yeah, I think you're you're exactly right. It is an art versus science issue. You know, we're we're uh, we're going out and you're you're smelling the cones, you're feeling the cones. You know, you, there's a visual evaluation, and that's all probably at the end of the day, that's probably driving more of the decision making than anything else. Is the farmers footprints in the field, you know, actually going out and seeing the, seeing the, the plants, smelling the hops, feeling the hops. Um, but then we also have uh, some measures that can back that up. You know, one of the more common ones we use is uh, dry matter. Uh, so hops at harvest, ideally, and it's, it varies a little bit by variety, but it's going to be right around 25% dry matter, meaning 75% of the cone is, is moisture. And so we're, we're, we can, we have a couple different method, methods of measuring that, but basically we can either dry the cones down weigh them dry versus wet and, and get that percent dry matter or we can distill the actual moisture out of the cone. Either way, you're getting the same number and it's telling you what that percentage is. And so we'll measure that starting in August and then and kind of watch that curve. Part of that measurement would be cone weight, how the, how's the cone weight developing and so on. You could take it a step further and actually measure your alpha acids and your oils and, and such things and, and, and kind of uh, confirm maturity with that as well. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a, you know, there's a number of factors that go into it and it's not just one number that you can rely on. It's, it's a, there's a kind of a process you go through in decision-making. Cool. And then I did, so you're kind of talking moisture content, things like that. I know that that plays a big difference in variety to variety when you're throwing them through the kiln and drying out those hops as well. Um, what's kind of the, the, harvesting process look like? Uh, do you guys use top cutters, bottom cutters? Is it kind of the, the general way of going? And then how do you get that from the binds into the kiln? Yes, yeah, so I, can, I can touch on that. So we use a, we use a top cutter, bottom cutter. Uh, we have, we fabricated our own top cutters. Uh, we have two main, or actually three main top cutters that we use. And then uh, we have uh, an extra one, an old, old top cutter that we utilize. And, and um, transport everything to the picking machine and on one side, on one picking machine that we, we refer to as the Peralt, Peralt machine, uh, we have two Peralt harvesters on the front end. Other picking machine, we, the Donhauer machine, we actually hang the hops. I talked a little bit earlier about hanging hops and that's kind of a, a harder job to fill, but uh, it's commonly done in the hop industry and there's not a lot of other ways to um, to, to actually get your hops into the machine other than the Peralt Harvester and actually hanging the hops. Um, so that's, that's in substance how we do it here at Peralt Farms. Uh, the Peralt Harvester, um, I guess I could speak on that a little bit. Um, that was actually, um, I think Jason was involved in, and uh, I was too young at the time, but um, my dad and Tim and, and uh, Peralt Manufacturing, uh, Ken and Chuck Peralt, uh, they started that here. They had, uh, I guess, a vision to make things better, and they were 
um, actually invested in new, uh, innovating a whole new picking process. Um, I do recall that uh, it started out as a combine out in the field, which didn't work out too well, and uh, slowly evolved into what you, we know today as the pearl harvester, which is pretty widely used in the hop industry nowadays. <clears throat> yeah, the, so that's, that's a Don Heller machine, but if you back up a little bit, um, that's, the back, that's the back end of the dribbles. Um, so right there, you can see that's uh, where that basket is. Uh, we actually have the drivers will back up and then we have our, our hop trucks actually dump and then we utilize a telehandler to fork the piles of hops into, uh, into the machine. And uh, really, uh, it's an extremely efficient way of doing things. I mean, you, uh, you eliminate those positions, um, you know, um, those, in this machine, we're talking up to 30 positions of hangers um, that you're eliminating. And it's a really hard job to, to fill. Um, it's, we're constantly having to hire new people to keep that job going. It, it is hard work. There's no, no getting around it. It's just, it's, it's hard work. Um, and uh, yeah, the Pearl Harvester. Oh yeah, here, I, I definitely don't recommend uh, ever um, asking your, your boss for a, a hug. I guess you can get away with things uh, in a family business that you can't get away with in, in regular business, but uh, definitely don't recommend that. <laughs> you gotta keep it light, right? You gotta keep it light. <laughs> so <laughs> you said you have the three different picking machines. You have the Don Hour, you have the hanging one. Um, Actually, I mean, first, can you do, can you explain the name Don Hour? <laughs> Jason might yeah. be better at that. Yeah, that's, uh, Don Hour really, uh, is, comes from a, a gentleman by the name of Florian Don Hour. He invented the, the Don Hour stationary picking machine, which is a, a pretty revolutionary uh, for, for the hop industry. You know, we went from, uh, give you an example, prior to the days of mechan mechanized picking when people had to hand pick art, our great grandfather had to hire a hundred people to, to uh, harvest 13 acres of hops and it took them 30 days. And now we're picking, you know, 1400 acres of hops in 30 days with 180 people. So uh, you can, you know, do the math there. It's a pretty big difference, but uh, uh, yeah. So Florian Downhauer who uh, owned a company out of, uh, or started his company in Santa Rosa, California, actually. Um, was uh was the one who invented that machine and uh yeah then and, and they're continuing to do it today i think I believe it's his uh grandson uh, tom fraser that continues to to run the down hour company today and uh yeah still selling machines yeah pretty neat uh do you guys notice uh any differences in i guess efficiencies labor anything like that uh like cleanliness of the pick from the hang machine versus the the bigger machine that you guys run <clears throat> You know, during the development, that was actually one of the biggest struggles because when you're, you know, when you're hanging the vines that in the, the older style, when you're hanging those vines, you're, you're, you're sending the, the vines through a stripper that strips the side arms and the leaves and the hops off. And the main vine goes out the back end of the machine straight into the chopper. So it doesn't have to be cleaned out in the process. But the Peral harvester has the challenge of it, it's, it's actually slicing that if you can imagine a big loaf of bread it's slicing that into that a pile of hops into pieces and that main vine has to go through that cleaning process. So it uses similar technology, which is a combination of force, air and gravity to separate the cones out. It's using similar technology, but you have to make, there's some added mechanized steps to actually clean that extra material out. Took us a while to get there, but over the years we fine tuned that and now we're picking uh, every bit as clean as, as the down hour. So I'd say in terms of cleanliness now, the two systems are very, com are, are comparable, basically the same. I think on the, on the video, um, you can see right before the dribbles, uh, you can see a stick drop. And it's kind of rolling the sticks out. Um, so that'll, that's kind of the answer to, to getting all those sticks out. I think it cleans everything up pretty, pretty similar to the down hour machine. Sweet. So um, from there, uh, you're harvesting, you're separating from the, from the vine, you're getting to just the clean cones. Uh, then from there, it goes into the kiln, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, what is kind of the procedure in kilning? I know what's, what's kind of a, your, that's the process of drying a hop to where you want it to get to. Um, what's kind of like a, a normal hop uh, content of moisture versus what you're trying to get it to? What temperatures do you guys usually run it at? Things like that. 
Yeah, they, they start out at, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we're 25% dry matter, meaning you're about 75% moisture. And the whole point of the kilning process would be to drop that down to, uh, to a final product of 10% moisture. What's a, what's a normal temp that you guys usually run? Uh, on our farm, we're typically around 128 degrees on the aroma hops. Um, we'll run as high as 140 on some of the other hops, but for the most part, we're, we're right in that. We, we, we strive for lower temp drying, but now, uh, you know, with some of these newer studies coming out regarding uh, uh, hop creep and some other things, we're, we're actually participating in a number of studies to, to examine different drying temps and see if there's a, there's a way of optimizing that. And that's another one of those things that's kind of the, the art versus science type of thing, yeah? So, um, what are there different certain hops that are a little harder to dry versus others? Yeah, it seems like um, mosaics take a little bit longer to dry. Uh, they can be up in the, the eight hour range uh, to be dried. So yeah, yeah, it definitely varies per variety. Cool. So um, one other thing I really wanted to touch on is the YCR, uh, the Yakima Chief Ranches side of things. Uh, I know, Jason, you take a big part in that, and uh, I've seen you out in the fields out smelling all the different uh, experimentals and everything like that. Um, what, what can you kind of touch on that and tell me a little bit about YCR? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, YCR was formed, uh, well, by the, the founding members of what eventually became Yakima Chief, um, the Peralt, Smith, and Carpenter families back in the, the start out in the late 80s. And uh, we started, we recognized early on uh, that uh, particularly when it came to, at the time, alpha hops, which was the primary driver of the hop market for the U.S. at the time, that uh, through breeding we could develop new and more efficient varieties. And so that was recognized early on and we were working with a, a gentleman by the name of Chuck Zimmerman on, on breeding and Chuck has a long history in, in, in hops and hop breeding. Um, if you look at most of the major varieties grown today, he has some, some role in it, um, including Cascade, Centennial, uh, CTZ, several others. So anyways, uh, uh, through Chuck's efforts, we started this breeding program and, uh, and uh, developed several great varieties, including Simcoe, Warrior, uh, Montanum, uh, Palisade, uh, and uh, those were all released, you know, in that early 2000s time frame. Um, and then in the, also in the early 2000s, we formed a joint venture with John I. Haas's breeding program called Hot Breeding Company. So it's a 50-50 joint venture. Consolidated both programs into one and now uh, release all our varieties through that effort, um, starting with Citra in 2008 and then Mosaic in 2012 and Equinot, uh, Laurel, Sabro, uh, and now uh, Talus, uh, Pato. So, yeah, so that's kind of the effort there. It's uh, just uh, primarily, you know, the main focus is, of course, uh, uh, variety development and then uh, the branding development to back that up and ensure that, you know, we're not just releasing a, a variety to the, to the powers that be that we're actually, you know, uh, protecting that value and then growing it through quality control and other measures as well. So uh, that's kind of the, the YCR's efforts in a nutshell. From the time you guys normally, like from the time you first breed a hop, you take a mother, father, um, how long does that usually take before you actually start seeing it out in mass production being sold to brewers? Yeah, it's generally about a 10 year process, development process. So from the time you make it cross to the time you have something that you're comfortable saying, yes, this, this has value, let's, let's go ahead and release this as a standalone brand, uh, it's about 10 years. The uh, issue that we run into is the, uh, well, there's a, there's a secondary process to that, and that is the commercialization step. And sometimes that can take even longer. You know, if you look at, uh, uh, interestingly, like something like Cascade, you know, it was bred in 1956, but wasn't released until the 70s and didn't really become prominent until the 80s and really prominent until the 90s. Um, and uh, Citra, uh, Gene Probasco made that cross in 1992, and we didn't release it until 2008 because it didn't have, there wasn't a commercial space for it, it didn't make sense. Simcoe had a similar story. We released it in 2000 uh, and it kind of just uh, foundered, you know, it wasn't doing anything. It, uh, in fact, we, we almost pulled it all out. Um, and, you know, I think by 2006, we were down to just a couple acres of it, uh, ready to pull the plug on it completely. And then it started to, to take off a bit more. And by 2010, then 
uh, or by 2011, I should say, uh, we still had just the three grow the three families growing it, and uh, we realized then that demand was kicking up so so fast that we weren't going to be able to handle all that, and so that's where we went outside of the group. So we went from three growers growing it in 2010 to now there's I think 40. Uh, roughly 40, 45 growers growing it across the Pacific Northwest now. So th there's a whole other timeline. So we can say, yeah, it's 10 years of development, but then it can take another, you know, uh, five to 10 years to get it to where it's, it reaches a critical mass. That, you know, it's a, what we'd consider a commercial success. You contrast that with something like Mosaic when we released, the timing was right, you know, it was, it was the right place and the right time for it. And Mosaic took right off. We released it in 2012 and, and uh, it saw immediate success. So, you know, it just uh, kind of depends if you're uh, in your right place, right time, and thank God for craft beer. <laughs> thank God for craft beer. It's crazy to think we almost lost that hop, too, you know? It was that yeah, close. Yeah. Um, so, kind of uh, finishing it up, uh, just personally, what are your guys' favorite hops, uh, both to grow and to drink? <laughs> Let you start that one off, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, I'll start that off. So I, uh, I, it's kind of hard to narrow down to one specific hop, but I really, uh, uh, mosaic. I just, you know, it's low disease pressure. It really tends to like our soil down here. Uh, we got a lot of rockier soil down here with a lot of heat, and it just seems to really thrive well. Um, I also, I'm a huge fan of Sabro. Um, I just, I really enjoy the the, the aroma. Um, in fact, if you could make a candle out of that aroma, I, I mean, I just love it. It's a, it's a great smelling hop, um, you know, towards uh, the end of August and the evenings, you can kind of smell it. We've got a, a Crossmore farm, we've got a Sabro yard growing and it's just a beautiful smell. You know, as the sun's going down, you've got Sabro, you can smell it. Um, so I'd say those are probably my two favorite varieties. And then of course, Simcoe, you know, everybody's got to love Simcoe's a great hop. So um, yeah, it's, those are, those are probably my three of my favorites. Yeah, that's a that's a tough question, especially as a breeder, because you know you you love them all for different reasons. That's why they're that's why they exist, why they were selected in the first place. But if I had to narrow it down and not cop out, you know, uh, with a generic answer, um, I have a soft spot for Simcoe. Always have, always will. That's a variety I got to work with uh, Chuck Zimmerman on is is the original breeder of Simcoe, and him and I spent a lot of years working on that. Um, so that was a you know holds a special place in my heart. Not to mention. Uh, you know, it's, it's got an incredibly smooth bittering profile. Uh, the aromatics, I think, are, are incredible and very versatile. Um, just makes a really good classic hoppy beer. Um, and uh, if you've ever had the opportunity to stand over a kiln as they're turning the air on for the first time, kind of that first breath of air coming off of the kiln is, is really incredible. It's, it's an unbeatable aroma. So. If I had to pick one, yeah, it'd definitely be probably Simcoe. Very cool. Yeah, I, I, Simcoe's up there with me as well. Um, so a big thing with YCH is that we are one of the few, maybe the only uh, grower-owned hop company. Uh, what that kind of does is it kind of cuts out that middleman and allows us to give a bigger return to the growers. And also that goes right back into the facilities. Uh, do you guys have any like fun projects coming up? Any cool upgrades you guys have coming? Well, um, we just finished a whole bunch, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping we can take a little bit of a break, but uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's been a, it's been an incredible ride the last few years. You know, if you, if you, you saw in the video, you know, a lot of our, our, our entire facility is, is pretty much new. You know, the oldest part of our picking process now is from 2012. Um, and I think that when people come, come by, they, you know, and that's all because of our ability to reinvest based upon the YCH philosophy and, and getting returns back at the growers and giving us that ability to reinvest. What's incredible to me is not that we have all these new facilities now. What's incredible is the last major improvement we made on the farm was in 1980. So from 1980 until 2012, we weren't able to do that. There wasn't uh, enough of a return to justify the risk of making that level of investment. So now we're at a state where we feel like it is truly sustainable and we, we feel comfortable taking that risk and reinvesting those funds into new facilities. So um, while, I, while I say we want to take a break, we've said that every year for the past few years, but yet we keep going. So while we don't have anything major, uh, you know, 
uh, penciled out in the moment, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next few years sees us with another big project. Sweet. Always something, right? <laughs> well, cool. Um, so now I think it's about that time. If you guys wouldn't mind to jump into that q and I want to thanks again so much for answering all my questions. I know everybody appreciates you being here. So I'll kind of just dig into a couple of these questions. Uh, First one from Josh Lindsay. Are you guys typically brewing a simple smash recipe on that pilot system to evaluate the hop or something a little more complex? I'll take that one. Uh, so the recipe we use uh, was actually uh, developed by Vinny at Russian River. It's based upon his hop to it recipe. We've made a few tweaks here and there, um, but it's still pretty close to what he originally had given us. Uh, the reason for that is because, uh, you know, for years I've been working with him on uh, on testing new varieties and that's the recipe he would use. So uh, not only does it showcase hop really well uh, and give, gives, gives us a good idea what the, the impact of that hop's going to be, uh, it, it also gives us uh, kind of an apples to apple comparison to a commercial uh, brewer to, to make sure that we have some some level of process control and, and we can we can make comparative uh, notes in that way. So that's kind of the, the idea there. And I know I saw those questions and the next question was related to that and uh, who's doing the brewing. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, it's actually uh, 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 Ashley Hale is her name. She's um, she's the quality and compliance uh, manager for YCR. And so she's kind of taken on that brewing role. She's doing a, a pretty incredible job uh, on our little uh, our little system. So, yeah. Yeah, Ashley's great. <laughs> Big fan of Ashley. Um, okay, and then one more question from Mac. Uh, I see that most of the hops developed out of YCR are either registered or trademarked. How do you go about registering and trademarking a hop? It's more in my wheelhouse as well. So the, the, uh, the, the strategy there, you know, after 10 years of investing in development, it, we take it a step further than just trademarking. We actually patent the hops, and that's, uh, that's a common practice in, uh, in, in the U.S., well, across the globe is to, is to plant to apply for plant patents based upon the, the unique genetic combination and process that it took to develop that variety. Um, that affords you 20 years of, of protection there. And then the idea with the trademark is to take the quality uh, and protection of that one step further. And so you apply for a trademark just like you would for any product, just like you would for whether it be, you know, you know, a, a beer or, or, or a brewery name or, or any product that you develop, you just go and apply for that trademark. And uh, what that does is, is it allows you to, uh, it allows us a place to place that quality. So when we start talking about value creation, we wanna put all that value in that brand and create something that's a recognized value, value across, the, uh, across the industry, something that sets us apart. And that's kind of the idea behind that is to place that value in that, in that, in that brand and, protect, and add us, give us another layer of protection. Next question is from Heidi. I have a little hop yard in Western North Carolina. My hops have browned out right before harvest last two years. Any idea what will cause them? Yeah, I can, I can answer that. So um, likely, kind of sounds like maybe you had some mite pressure or uh, perhaps uh, some mildew pressure, depending on the variety. Uh, hops, um, mites are probably our biggest pest. Um, aphids are also a big pest. Um, and pathogens, of course, we've got powdery mildew and downy mildew. Uh, on our hop farm, we start clear back in, in, uh, in April, um, kind of scouting our fields. At that point, we're looking for powdery mildew. Um, there's different practices such as uh, pruning down early in the season that'll mitigate uh, mildew pressure. And then throughout the growing season, starting in May, um, all the way into August, end of August, we're checking weekly for um, average mite counts, uh, mildew pressure, aphid counts, and then also beneficial insects. So um, we try to, early in the season, having higher mite pressure is typically better because you're going to attract more beneficial insects. Um, and usually, typically, if you do have that higher mite pressure and you have beneficial insects that are, they'll help you out enough to where you won't have to, you can mitigate your sprays. So, but yeah, the reddening, I, I'm, I'm guessing probably um, you'll want to check throughout the season for spider mites, two spotted spider mites, and that's probably your issue. Cool. 
Uh, one more question. Uh, once commercially established, how many years do you let vines grow from the same crown? Uh, you're not digging them up every year, right? Is there a seven or 10 year lifespan you target? Um, it varies. I mean, you know, traditionally, I, if a hop crown is taken care of, it will last indefinitely. You know, that crown is perennial. Um, and it kind of depends on the market conditions. You know, years ago, um, we would have left yards in for quite a long time, probably minimum of 10 years. You know, you didn't see a lot of turnover in, in the varieties you were growing because there was a lot fewer varieties growing. Now today with craft beer and the amount of, you know, new varieties coming online or the, the changing taste preferences, we're switching out quite a bit more. So I would say on average, you know, a yard's probably seven to 10 years uh, max lifespan. With that said, we just uh, two years ago pulled out a CTZ yard that we planted in 1988. So occasionally you get those yards that, you know, do last a long time. It just kind of varies upon market condition and what's in demand. But certainly not pulling them out every year and changing out. That's an, an expensive prospect. So if we can leave them in, we, we do. That looks like all the questions so far. Um, if anybody has any, please feel free to throw them out. But if not, um, I just want to say thank you so much, Jason. Thank you so much, Jeff, uh, for jumping on. This was awesome. Always good chatting with you guys. Hopefully I get to see you and come, some, come rub some hops with you guys here this year and in the next coming weeks, probably. Um, but yeah, thanks again. I know YCH appreciates it. Everybody on definitely appreciates it. And uh, Keep on coming out with some really badass hops, guys. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for putting all this together. It's, it's pretty cool. You know, this virtual harvest. Uh, of course. Okay, yeah. Next year we'll get together again. Yeah. So hopefully this will be behind us and get back to, back to somewhat normal. Yeah. Fingers crossed all around. So um, before I let everybody go again, huge, huge thank you to all of you, JT, Jason, Jeff, and the whole Peralt family, especially helping them putting the farm tour video together. That was great. Um, so thank you again so much for presenting. And then just a quick reminder uh, to everyone out there, this session was recorded and will be available on demand at virtualharvest.com here shortly. Um, and other than that, um, that's it for me. So thank you everybody again for joining us today on this virtual harvest session and hope to see you on the next one. We have one a live one again today at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So hope to see you all soon. Happy drinking. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.